I'd like to read the uh, second uh, section of Acts chapter 16 and then uh, look at the first couple of questions. And then uh, we're going to sing a psalm and then we'll look at the second uh, or the, th the third question or the last question. So it's Acts chapter 16 uh, on page 1112 one, one, of the Pool Pew Bible. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that, they, that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. Amen. We give thanks to God for this word that we are able to read and this account of the early New Testament church. So we've come to Paul's second missionary journey. Paul has finished with uh, the guys he was with, first journey, and now we come to second missionary journey. And basically, he is going to different cities and towns, strengthening existing churches, he goes to encourage them. He goes to bring them good news and good uh, teaching. And he also plants new churches. He goes to new towns and new cities and plants churches there. And I think that's a really great model for denominations, for churches today. I think it's, it would be really good for us to get back to very simple um, focus in our churches. As churches, we are there to strengthen the believers, encourage them, and in our countries to plant new churches. 
That would be a great model on which to base all our committees and all our strategies as a church, as a denomination. And I think the ecclesiastical landscape in Scotland is changing rapidly. It's not going to be the same as it always was. It's not going to be how we always envisaged it to be. But I think it's very important for us that in these changes ecclesiastically, that we are gospel people first, free church people second. That we're going out with the gospel, that we're encouraging one another with the gospel, that we're planting churches that are gospel-centered churches and reaching out uh, to the lost of our nation. Getting back to what we were 160 maybe years ago as a church, for an example, making strong, planting new. It's very radical. It's also very simple. And it's a good focus for us to have. Okay, so that's just by way of introduction. Now we've got some questions here in uh, the order of service, the bulletin sheet. And as we've been doing, we're going to look, I'm going to look through the first couple of questions and apply the truths of this chapter to ourselves so that we, I hope, understand what Scripture is saying to us uh, as we look at it together. So, the first question is, considering Paul's vehement opposition to adding anything else to the gospel, remember we looked at that last week, there was a big discussion at the assembly, at the council in Jerusalem, which said that the Gentiles needed to accept Jesus as their Savior and that circumcision was not something that was necessary to their faith and we weren't to add anything to uh, their faith except belief in Jesus Christ. And then they were encouraged to be sympathetic or uh, considerate of uh, Jewish believers by uh, accepting the kosher laws and things like that during this time. But they had this big dis discussion and decision about what the gospel was, didn't they? And Paul and Barnabas would say, no, it's not Jesus Christ plus, in that case, getting circumcised, having the Old Testament rituals. It's not that. You don't do that. Jesus Christ alone. So considering Paul's vehement opposition to adding anything to the gospel, why can he allow Timothy here to be circumcised? Because we read that, didn't we, at the beginning of the chapter, that he took a new uh, team member with him, Timothy, Brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews that lived in that area, for they all knew his father was a Greek. And they traveled from town to town, delivering the decisions and strengthening the church, and the church grew in numbers. So, we have a contradiction there, do we not? Where Paul in the previous chapter said, no to circumcision, absolutely not. It's the gospel and nothing else. And now, we have him encouraging Timothy to be circumcised. Why can he allow that? What's happening here? Why is Timothy being allowed to be circumcised? Is that not against everything that he stood for at the council in Jerusalem, the previous chapter? Thinking caps on. Don't be passive. This is the Word of God. You read it in your own homes. You've got to understand what it's saying. Otherwise, you walk away thinking it's contradictory. And it can't be trusted, and it's not significant. Why do you think Timothy here is being circumcised? Why is Paul allowing that to happen? I did get some answers online. Okay. Good answer. Did everyone hear that? It wasn't adding anything to the gospel correct? It was that he was allowing Timothy to be more acceptable as an evangelist among the Jewish people that they'd be going to. It was uh, very similar to the uh, circumstances of the previous chapter. It was missional accommodation. So, in order for uh, Timothy to be more accepted uh, in the same way as the Gentiles in the previous chapter 
we're going to not take part in the uh, uh, dietary uh, requirements or the dietary freedom that they were allowed as they were worshipping and as they were witnessing. So here uh, we see that Timothy is willing voluntarily, we presume, uh, to go to great lengths to not be a stumbling block as he goes out with the gospel, but he's willing to uh, take part in this ritual, not because it adds to his salvation or is significant for his salvation, but because uh, he knows it will make him more uh, readily acceptable and will be listened to by the Jewish people that they go to the gospel with first, and then as they reach out to everyone else. Uh, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we kind of have this principle being worked out by Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14. In the same way, the Lord, uh, um, nah, I'll go further down, I think, uh, from verse maybe 19, yeah. Though I am free, Paul says, I belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. And that's an outstanding uh, commentary on his and the willingness of uh, others to go to great lengths to be all things to all. Sometimes that in our, our churches has become a dirty word. So you're all things to all men. You've got no backbone. You just go with the flow. You just blow whichever way the wind's blowing. But that's not what's been spoken about here. This is spoken about real moral courage, knowing what you believe, knowing what's significant, knowing what you can compromise on. And for the sake of winning people over Christ, you are willing to be flexible in order to do so. And that is exactly what was happening, I believe, with Timothy. It wasn't a gospel necessity. It wasn't in order that he would be an acceptable Christian that he was circumcised. Because we, in Galatians 2, verse 3, we have Paul arguing that Titus, who he takes with him, should not be circumcised. A different situation, different background, different uh, surroundings. And he argues there, no, he's not going to be, because that would compromise the gospel message. But here it's different. Timothy agrees willingly as a missionary to accommodate those to whom he's going with the gospel uh, with this sacrificial and painful act for the sake of the gospel. Missional accommodation. Okay. Emma. Yes. Uh, I think it does make a difference that he was partly Jewish as well. He had a Jewish mother and a Greek father, and that again would have been something that would have made it more acceptable for him to uh, be among and witness among Jews if he went through that ritual and he was willing to do so for the sake of the gospel. Okay, now the second question is slightly different from what we normally do. I'm not quite sure if anyone will respond to it, uh, but there's a reason for me doing that this evening. There are three stories of people in Philippi, this is where he church plants, coming to faith in Jesus. There's Lydia, there's the servant girl, who we don't have her name, and we have the jailer, who we also don't have his name. And these are three different characters, and they're in a town where he's preaching the gospel and planting a church. And these three, this is the examples that he gives of three people coming to faith. Would you be willing to choose one of them Imagine what their testimony would be like, background, job, character, conversion, etc., and share it from the pew tonight. So you've got, and the reason I'm doing that is because you've got three very different type of people. You've got Lydia, the slave girl, and the Philippian jailer. 
Uh, is anyone willing to imagine what their testimony would be like and share it? I recognize not the sort of thing you can just maybe do off the top of your head. But if anyone uh, did think about uh, days, please. Okay, you're a slave girl, so. Excellent, excellent. So you're thinking there of someone who has nothing, absolutely nothing in her life. Uh, She's a slave girl. She's probably Greek. She's a resident in Philippi, undoubtedly without any self-esteem, owned nothing, uh, possessed of an evil spirit, Uh, not a lot going for her. But with that possession, she has knowledge of spiritual realities and was able to discern these men of God and the message they were bringing. Okay. Then we have Lydia and the jailer. Murdo, did I see something on the website that you said that you were willing to be a jailer?
Okay, excellent. Thanks, Murdo. So we've got the jailer and we've got the slave. The jailer was very probably a Roman soldier, retired Roman soldier, tough individual, probably roughly kind of middle class type person who would have his own home and uh, fairly uh, uh, pleasant uh, standard of living. And uh, then the first person is Lydia. And Lydia is different again. She's maybe Asiatic. She's wealthy. She's an individual businesswoman, uh, intellectual, and hears the word of God. And uh, God opens her heart. And we have three people there from hugely different uh, cultural backgrounds, different sociological backgrounds, different sexes, different uh, uh, employment, completely different, and different status in life. And Jesus Christ is the one who redeems them and buys them back and sets them free. And they become united in one church, the church in Philippi that ends up being a church that Paul writes to. I just want to say one thing about that. A Jewish man at the time of Christ, a good upstanding Jewish man at the time of Christ, would pray a prayer every morning, and that prayer was, I thank you, my God, for not having let me be, be born a woman, a Gentile, or a slave. That wasn't a biblical prayer, it wasn't an Old Testament prayer, it was a prayer that came into the Jewish religion. And here we have that prayer being turned on its head, that God starts, founds this church with a Gentile, a woman, and a slave. They were worthless to ordinary people, but they were hugely significant and worthy to the living God. And that's how that church was started. I want us to sing again uh, together uh, before looking at the last sections. And it's in Psalm 40, which is a psalm of well-known. It's, it's from the traditional version of the psalm, uh, a psalm of testimony. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry here. We'll stand to sing and Hamish will lead us as he sings. for the Lord my God and patiently did bear at length to me he did incline my voice and cry to
Okay, briefly then, what lessons can we learn from the, this chapter about the nature of the church? Well, I'm just going to say a little bit about that because we already talked about it. It's God's body, it's God's people uh, by design. And what we see, at least from this chapter, is that it's ascending church. It's an outgoing church. It reaches out. It is a church that is looking to build uh, the kingdom of God and to plant uh, gospel ministry in new places. Relentlessly evangelistic. We can become very good at navel gazing and looking inward and examining ourselves and criticizing and condemning maybe ourselves or others. But the New Testament church is a relentlessly evangelistic church, ascending church. It's a church that strengthens its members. We saw that, didn't we? Paul and uh, Timothy went around and they strengthened the believers in the new churches. They made them strong. What did they do? They took them back to foundations. We were looking at this morning to First Peter. The foundations of the gospel, they strengthened them in the faith. It's a growing church. I'm told that at the end of this chapter that the church... Uh, the, no, it's not actually the end, of the, it's the end of the first section. The churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. It's a growing church. And a div- as we also saw from the three examples that are given of this church, it's only three. We know that there would have been a lot more. The three examples are given. It's a diverse church. And that may be a challenge to us that it's a diverse church. It's a church where there's all kinds of people and that they are equally loved and embraced and accepted in Christ. But secondly, God's guidance for his people. What can we learn about God's guidance? See, there's this that second section where uh, Paul and his companions travel. They have a plan to reach out in the second mission. They go certain places and the door to these places, as, as, as we would quite often use the terminology, the door's closed. Uh, they can't go to the province of Asia. Uh, then they can't go uh, to Bithynia. And then when they're waiting, Paul gets a vision, come over to Macedonia, and then they conclude that that's where God had called them to preach the gospel. So there's a wee section there about God guiding his people. Probably the most common question I get as a pastor is, what's God's will for me? How do I know what God wants for me? And this is a passage about guidance, a short passage about guidance. Is there anything that you think we can learn about guidance from God from this short passage, God's guidance for his people? Is there anything? Tom, are you just blowing your cheeks out or you look like you had an answer there? Okay. They re- responded to the guidance they'd been given. Okay. And what was the guidance? How, in, what, in what form did it come? In a vision. Okay. Anything else we can learn about God's guidance? Do you think um, it says, for example, uh, they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia? Then we're told the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go to Bithynia. Okay. Do you think, how do you think God transmitted that information to them. We don't know, do we? We're not told. You presume, maybe you make presumptions about uh, how God spoke to them. But as they look back, they recognize that God didn't want them to go that way. How did he do it? I don't know. Did he do it legally in terms of of using some kind of uh, legal prohibition for them to go in there? Did he use illness? Did he use a coincidence of something that happened during the day? Did he speak to them directly as he later did in the vision? We don't really know. But we do know he closed certain doors for them. And then he opened uh, the door to preach in Macedonia. 
So they discerned, whatever, however God spoke to them, they discerned that God didn't want them to go certain places. They'd made plans, remember? As believers, as evangelists, they'd made plans to go certain places. God said, no, I've got a different plan for you, and he made it clear for them. But then the last section where we're told that they leave from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them there. That word concluding uh, really means bringing together in one mind. In other words, they had this vision, but they didn't just accept it like that and say, oh, that's God who spoke to us in the vision. They sat down and they considered together what God had been saying over the last number of uh, days and weeks and concluded that indeed this is what he wanted them to do. So there was a progressive revelation of God's will to them, what we would call some doors being closed, some doors being opened. And I'm sure for some of the time as they traveled about and as places the, their plans were being changed, they were perplexed. Well, what's God wanting from us? Where does he want us to go? What does he want us to do? We've made all these great plans to preach the gospel and he's closing the door. We don't know where we're going and we don't know what his plan is. It must have been for them perplexing until finally God made clear to them what his will was. And I think we recognize that in our own lives, that sometimes our plans, he changes by closing the doors, by not allowing. We look and we believe that we're going to get a certain job or we're going to get in a certain degree course, or we're going to go out with some certain person. And he closes that door. It doesn't happen. And we have to wait. And sometimes we're perplexed about what his plans are, what his purposes are, but we wait on him. And uh, we uh, hopefully don't just go on a whim, but we conclude, we pray, and we come together in one mind, learning from other Christians what God's will is for us, using the church, using our city groups, using our Christian friendships to know God's will in our lives. Guidance is a very important thing. And as these people prayed and waited on the Lord, he made his mind clear to them. Okay, common elements in Christian conversion. You've got three different conversions that we looked at there. There was Lydia, the slave girl, and the jailer. Is there anything about them, although they're hugely different, uh, that is common to all three that is important for us to remember. And just go one more thing and then we close. So Christian conversion here, Lydia, the slave girl and the jailer, what's common to them all? Hearing the word of God in their own environment. Okay, so they hear a message and they hear a message in a circumstance that they're, well, the jailer wasn't very relaxed, but he was in his own environment. So the word of God has gone out to them. A message has been brought to them. Lydia is praying. She's at the place of prayer. Slave girl is going about her occultic work. And the jailer is jailing. <laughs> okay. And the message is brought to them. Okay. The message, there is a message that's brought to them. Okay. That is a common element. They hear a message. A Christ-centered message is brought to them intentionally. And it's brought to them by other people, by you and me. Okay. Common, what other elements are common here to Christian conversion? Sorry? There's a transformation of their lives. Almost immediately, their lives are changed. They see the love of Christ. And in two cases, we... we the evidence of the slave girl is rather circumstantial. We're not actually told that she comes to faith, but we're told that she's healed from her evil spirit. But the other two, the, there's immediate change. Their hearts are opened. So are their homes. Lydia wants the believers to come back to her house. And so does the Philippian jailer. He, wants, he opens his home. So he's opening his life, in other words, to the Christians immediately as a quick transformation. Anything else that's common to them all? Yeah, God is crucially involved. God's Holy Spirit works in each of those conversions. He opens Lydia's heart. He heals uh, the slave girl, and he uses an earthquake and the message of the gospel to change the Philippian jailer. There's divine orchestration 
in each of these conversions. And that is hugely significant for us as we crave people's souls in St. Columbus and among our friends. That we see these common elements that we are used. There's messengers who bring a message. It's not just our lives, but the message that uh, comes from our lives, the message of the good news of the gospel. And uh, uh, we're used to share that message, but also we need God. We need God to open people's hearts, to intervene, to cooperate, as it were. Although the whole work of conversion is his, he still uses us, and we desperately need him to work in people's hearts, to open people's hearts, to, to answer our prayers for people so that they will come to faith. So there are these common elements that are still the same today. Uh, when people come to Christ, there's evidence of changed lives, there's joy, there's healing, there's openness, there's hospitality. God is crucially involved. There's a message that needs to be shared, and we are the people who God uses to share that message. And that's, if we're going to be a church planting church, if we're going to share the gospel, these things are very important for us. Okay, last thing. Uh, what does the chapter tell us about being mission-minded? I maybe just tell, I'll just share with you what I have from this as we close. Um, because we have here Paul uh, and Timothy going out with the gospel. We recognize and we see, I hope, that they are sensitive to God's word and God's will and God's mind for them. They're willing to change their plans uh, as they are mission-minded because they're sensitive to what God is saying. They're willing to take risks for the gospel. Paul uh, and Timothy are willing to be imprisoned uh, for the gospel. They're willing to share the gospel in that way. Pa sorry, Paul and Silas uh, in prison. They are uh, willing to be beaten uh, for the gospel. Timothy is willing to be circumcised for the gospel. Great sacrificial spirit uh, in going out with the gospel. They're culturally sensitive. They're prayerful. They're able to praise and magnify God even in the midst of suffering. And their lives are hugely intentional uh, for the gospel. They have this focus for Jesus Christ and the gospel. So I hope that you find that in these chapters, we don't only have a record of the founding of the church in the New Testament, but we have models of Christian living, Christian mission, church uh, and church polity and church life and uh, all that goes with that that is relevant and applicable to our own lives and the personal guidance from God that we can learn from chapters like this and may it be that we're able to do so. I hope that you're able at some point during these, um, this series to just click onto the website answer some of the questions because it's great because I find that the answers people give are very different sometimes what I'm thinking uh, and therefore I learn from that and I hope that others learn also as we share our thoughts uh, around God's word together. So let's bow our heads and pray uh, as we think about these words. Lord God we thank you for the gospel, we thank you for the message of the gospel, we thank you for uh, Dr. Luke and his recording of this early church missionary work uh, by the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that at least on some of this journey as we read in this chapter, uh, Luke was a colleague, was a team member uh, with uh, Paul and uh, Silas and Paul and Timothy. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for uh, the relevance of the message still as it reaches out to us in our lives. And we pray that we would uh, be a diverse people, that we would be welcoming of those different to us and from us, but united in one family in the name of Jesus Christ, that uh, we would recognize that uh, uh, the New Testament broke all kinds of barriers so that there was neither slave nor free, male nor female, and that there was neither Jew nor Greek, but in Christ, all 
we're one, and we thank you that in Christ we are one, and we pray that we would be one, not just in name only, but in love and in work and in sacrifice and in commitment to one another. We pray that we would have a passion to share the gospel and that we would see our role, our cooperative role in sharing the message in um, not only living for Christ, uh, not only praising God in the midst of bleak and difficult circumstances, but also telling people about the great good news of Jesus and uh, his uh, wonderful salvation. So may we be uh, simple messengers, uh, ambassadors for Jesus. Bless us as we sing together a parting psalm of praise and may it uh, lift our spirits as we leave this evening for the challenges and the pleasures and uh, uh, the difficulties in some cases of this week into which we've entered. By God's grace, may we uh, move forward uh, in faith and through the Holy Spirit. Amen.